laboratory directions for the male reproductive system. Learning objectives for the male reproductive systems. 1. Be able to identify and describe the general histological architecture of the testis. 2. Be able to identify and describe the cell types comprising the germinal epithelium of the seminiferous tubules and the functional significance of each. 3. Be able to identify and describe the interstitial tissue and understand the functional significance of the contained Leydig cells. 4. Be able to identify and describe the histological structure of the different regions constituting the uh, excretory ductal system that links the testis to the urethra and be able to relate the structural significance uh, of each. And five, be able to identify and describe the histological structure of the male accessory sex glands and relate the structure of these glands to their function. This is a region of the testis as seen with the scanning objective. The area as indicated by the pointer is that dense connective tissue covering the testis known as the tunica albiginia, consisting primarily of uh, collagen, uh, fibroblasts, although there is a few scattered occasional uh, smooth muscle cells uh, are present. This happens to be a primate testis because of the better preservation using this particular specimen and if one focuses on the arrow this is where the tunica vasculosa uh, would be that which resides just interior along the interior surface of the tunica albiginia. If we course along here you can see it's relatively, uh, or at least vessels aren't obvious in this particular preparation at this magnification. Here we have a small arteriole, another one ending, entering at this particular uh, point. Nonetheless, it's not obvious on this particular specimen, but it is quite obvious uh, if one examines uh, human uh, preparation. Now, if we go down and begin down uh, the external surface of the tunica albiginia, one should, even at this magnification, barely perceive some flattened mesothelial cells uh, lying on the external surface of the tunic. Uh, this would be the visceral layer of the uh, tunica vaginalis. So we go from tunica vaginalis, that very thin uh, mesothelial lining, tunica albiginia, should be a tunica vasculosa here, and then finally getting into the seminiferous tubules, which of course fill the heart of the testis. So each one of these structures, very closely packed together, is an example of a seminiferous tubule. And the testis consists of a number of such tubules. Uh, and fills the entire field of view. Though not obvious on this particular preparation, the interstitial tissue will lie between the seminiferous tubules and separate them. And this is where the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells, of course, will be found. Uh, and these, as you will recall, uh, produce the male sex steroid testosterone. So find and identify some of the seminiferous tubules at, at, uh, and examine them at increased magnification uh, for the various cell types. The same testis viewed at a slight increase in magnification to perhaps show in greater detail uh, the seminiferous tubules. One is shown here Another here, these of course are being cut in cross section or transverse section 
and another profile here that begins to meander off and then down towards the bottom of the field. Another of these tubules is cut and more or less along its length, at least for a short distance, and the lumen of the seminiferous tubule courses here as indicated by the arrow or the tip of the arrow and then curves back around uh, uh, to the <coughs> right. Another profile would be shown here. So we have several seminiferous tubules packed very closely together in this particular specimen and the interstitial tissue, at least on this sample, is very, very difficult uh, to discern. However, one will chance upon small areas such as here and around here, one can see small blood vessels. Uh, this is where one should look for the interstitial cells, the interstitial tissue, uh, and the lighting cells that will reside within it. So these are seminiferous tubules, several of them seen at a little bit uh, uh, higher magnification than the previous example. Just to illustrate the boundaries of the tubules perhaps a little bit better and the intervening uh, interstitial uh, type tissue that lies, of course, between uh, these closely packed uh, seminiferous tubules. So one should just arbitrarily uh, pick one, begin to look at it at increased magnification, and examine several cross-sectional profiles of the seminiferous tubules as there will be uh, different cell associations uh, with each profile. As one looks at these two, as indicated by the arrow, one can see uh, the mature spermatids, or the late spermatids, I should say, uh, in the apical region, or what would be the apical region, of the uh, serotoli cell. They're relatively mature and are about to be released by the seminiferous uh, tubule, that is, the serotoli cells. Compare these two profiles with uh, some of the adjacent ones, and you can see that the cell association is different. There's different stages of uh, spermatogenesis that are uh, taking place or are frozen in time in this particular, uh, these particular tubes. So examine a couple of these and just note the cell types at increased magnification. This field is a cross-section of a seminiferous tubule seen at increased magnification. Perhaps one of the first things that's advisable to do is to see where the position of the Sertoli cells. A Sertoli cell nucleus is shown here. Another one is shown here. The cytoplasm of one is shown here. The nucleus is of another is shown here. The nucleus of another Sertoli cell is shown here and has the good, uh, well-defined nucleus as indicated by the tip of the arrow. A Sertoli cell is shown here, another here, another here with that characteristic nuclear profile, another here, and another one being crossed by the arrow. If one looks at this particular uh, Sertoli cell, one can visualize the cytoplasmic base or the boundary where it lies upon a basal lamina next to this uh, paratubular connective tissue that's uh, surrounding uh, the uh, seminiferous tubule. That's what the, these flattened cells, or those so-called myoid cells, that make up this paratubular or boundary uh, type of connective tissue. So this is an example of some of those uh, cell types. But getting back to the Sertoli cell, its base will lie on the basement membrane. This is the cytoplasm of this particular Sertoli cell. And remember, the Sertoli cell will go reach or extend from the basal lamina all the way to form the lining of the uh, seminiferous tubule. So its cytoplasmic apex is somewhere in this particular uh, region. So this is the boundary of this particular, or the height, I should say, of this particular uh, Sertoli cell. One can somewhat make out uh, the cytoplasmic extent of this one, goes here and then perhaps up this far. Nonetheless, uh, 
Those are the Sertoli cells. These dark staining, darkly stippled nuclei along the base belong to the spermatogonia. They're oval shaped cells that hug and lie on the basement membrane. They would be within the basal compartment uh, of this uh, particular uh, germinal epithelium. This would be spermatogonia, another spermatogonium here. By simple chance, these are all classified as type A spermatogonia. One such is up at the opposite end for comparison and lying on the basement membrane. This is be more akin to a uh, type B spermatogonium. The cell types in meiosis with the chromosomes uh, as indicated by the pointer, these are all primary spermatocytes. And of course we have the late spermatids uh, within the uh, lining the lumen of this particular uh, tubule. An additional field to show uh, two adjacent seminiferous tubules that are in different stages of a seminiferous wave. Uh, the cell types and the one shown to the right, one can make out the Sertoli cells. And then down at the bottom, I can't quite reach it. The spermatogonia, and that is quite as well preserved. Primary spermatocytes. All of these smaller round ones, like this uh, association here, are early spermatids. Uh, these appear to be, even at this mag, one can make out they're still in cytoplasmic continuity. And these are the heads of the late spermatids with their tails extending out into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule, uh, about to be released by the Sertoli cell. One can see uh, a little bit better on this particular specimen the base of the Sertoli cell, its cytoplasm extending uh, to the apex, and is associated with the uh, five or six uh, late spermatids shown in its apex. A few residual bodies, the cytoplasmic droplets that are being shed can also be seen scattered in the lumen. One can even see evidence of phagocytosis by the uh, Sertoli cells of these particular uh, cast off uh, bits of uh, cytoplasm. So if one can make out quite well in this case, the base to the apex of the Sertoli cell gives you its length. It does show the good nuclear uh, profile and one can envision uh, these cells going up along its lateral uh, surface and then coming back down, that is the spermatogenic cells. Uh, this particular tubule looks a quite a bit different because different uh, associations are uh, in evidence. Uh, it's pushed a little bit, it appears. This is the Sertoli uh, cell here, as defined by its nucleus. Another one is shown here. The gonia, of course, would be down at the base as well. These are the primary uh, dividing uh, spermatocytes. And these are all, these small round nucleated cells are all early uh, spermatids. A field of the intervening interstitial tissue between uh, profiles from four seminiferous tubules to illustrate a Leydig cell in this particular preparation. This is the uh, nucleus of the uh, Leydig cell. It, in this case, shows a very distinct nucleus. Its cytoplasm extends about this far and is being traced by the pointer. Uh, so this and this particular preparation is the Leydig cell. Uh, remember, it is uh, the cell type that's producing testosterone, uh, the male hormone, uh, in this particular uh, prep. And it is going to be under the control of interstitial uh, cell secreting hormone, or stimulating hormone, I should say, uh, the equivalent to LH in the female system.
two adjacent Leydig cells as indicated by the pointer in the interstitial uh, tissue between uh, seminiferous tubules as seen at high magnification. Please recall that these particular cells are the target of interstitial cell stimulating hormone or LH, uh, equivalent terms, and that the primary secretory product of this cell type is testosterone. Another short clip of the seminiferous uh, tubule looking at the germinal epithelium, but extreme magnification, extremely high magnification. Uh, this is rather an unusual uh, preparation, that's why I'm illustrating it once again, because I, you can make out the luminal border made up of the Sertoli cell that's curving around in this direction. So once again, to repeat at this high magnification, these are the Sertoli cell nuclei. Here's another one indicating the characteristic nucleolus. Another is shown here, and another one is shown here. The cytoplasm extends from where it lies on the basement membrane and is adjacent to this paratubular connective tissue to this location where one can make out the fused apical cell membranes. The other cell types that can be visualized uh, within this preparation, if I move this just slightly, are spermatogonia, the primary spermatocytes, once again, early spermatids, as indicated by the pointer, and late spermatids. Uh, this is sort of flat on, and this is cut at the other angle if you uh, I turned a plate vertically towards your face and looked at it. Uh, one can even make out the beginning of the middle piece here in the spermatozoa, so they are uh, late spermatid. So these are almost uh, two spermatozoa. One can make out the tails coming off, so they're well formed. And it wouldn't be very long before they were transported up and released uh, by the uh, Sertoli cell. Another spermatogonium, perhaps a little bit better, showing its oval nature of its cytoplasm and its nucleus, is shown in the adjacent uh, seminiferous tubule. Please do recall that the Sertoli cell is the target of FSH. Uh, coming from gonadotrophs in the anterior pituitary, and that its primary secretory products are androgen binding protein and that glycoprotein known as inhibin. This is a preparation of adult uh, human testis. I think it's important to see at least uh, uh, a portion of these uh, preparations of human material. Arrow indicates at the very edge, once again, uh, the simple squamous mesothelium of the uh, tunica vaginalis. This region here of dense collagen obviously is going to be the tunica albiginia. Now, what this particular preparation shows in a uh, that the primate or the monkey preparation does not show is the well-developed nature of the tunica vasculosa, which lies along the interior surface of the tunica albigenia. Here is a large, well not a large, but a well-developed artery uh, coursing along uh, this area of the connective tissue. The seminiferous tubules obviously are located to the extreme uh, right of the field, but let's course along this boundary between that intense concentration of the seminiferous uh, tubules and the tu surrounding or limiting tunica albiginia. Another large vessel, as one can see, uh, as, uh, as viewed in cross-section, indicating there, uh, these are small arteries. Uh, 
a much smaller caliber one shown here. So as one courses along the internal surface of the tunic albigini, unlike the primate one, one can see the intense vascular, su vascular supply coursing along this uh, interior surface of the tunica albigenia. Here we see another uh, fairly large vessel that's cut uh, sort of at an oblique angle. Other profiles shown here and one can then make out feeder vessels going into the interstitial tissue that is going to supply uh, the nutritional needs of uh, this particular organ or the seminiferous tubules. And here we can see again most of the profiles we're visualizing are small arteries. Uh, the veins are perhaps uh, collapsed somewhat or empty, but one gets a much better idea. You can, the connective tissue is a little bit looser and it is containing these very, very large uh, vessels. So that primate uh, preparation, though excellent in its preservation, uh, it's just a little bit misleading uh, because one doesn't get the impression of the intense vascularity uh, that one uh, sees looking at uh, the human preparation. Here you can see a little bit larger or smaller artery, I should say, actually coursing into between the seminiferous tubules. And here we have uh, a small vein. Uh, so those are is one difference uh, and one that uh, everyone should be aware of, this uh, uh, tunica vasculosa. It is indeed a uh, prominent structure in the human condition. Uh, these are all seminiferous tubules of this human preparation. You can see there are small arteriole caliber vessels uh, meandering in the interstitial tissue uh, and between the seminiferous tubules. The tunica albigenia, once again, seen at increased uh, magnification, simply to illustrate the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis, that simple squamous mesothelial covering that lies on the exterior surface of the tunica albigenia. And this is just a run through the tunica albigenia of the uh, human testis. Dense interwoven. Uh, college, collagenous connective tissue. A fairly well-preserved region of human testis showing uh, several profiles through the seminiferous uh, tubules. One is, large one is shown at the base of the field or the bottom of the field. One is indicated here, one coursing across the top and then one to the left. This area here is the intervening interstitial uh, connective tissue or interstitial tissue showing an arteriole, uh, another arteriole here. But within this primitive type of connective tissue, one can make out a fairly decent cluster of the Leydig cells or the interstitial cells, those cells that are producing testosterone. And even at this relatively low magnification, one can make out the crystalloids, the crystalloids of Reinke uh, within the cytoplasm of these particular steroid producing cells. Uh, this one here appears to be binucleate and this too is not an uncommon feature of these particular cells. This field represents a high power uh, view of Leydig cells. So there's a cluster of Leydig cells in the center of the field of view and is being traced by the pointer. A seminiferous tubule is shown to the right, one to the left, and one at the top of the field of view. So we're in the interstitial connective tissue even though it's pulled apart. So each one of these large cells is a human Leydig cell and this dark staining 
body uh, with the uh, eosinophilic nature to it within these cells are these crystalloids of Reinkate. So they're very large round cells and in the human condition unlike that primate that was observed earlier oftentimes will form into these large clusters of cells in the uh, interstitial tissue. Well, these are the cells, the testosterone producing uh, cells, showing you both a, a relatively abundant cytoplasm, they're fairly large cells, and with these very prominent crystalloids, the crystalloids of Reinke. These are two adjacent seminiferous tubules from that human testis, just to illustrate the germinal epithelium in this particular preparation, though it's much less well preserved. Uh, these nuclei, as indicated by the pointer, because of their nucleoli and sort of light nuclear uh, staining, a lot of considerable amount of euchromatin, are the nuclei of the Sertoli cells. So they can be made out uh, quite readily, even on a poorly preserved and a relatively thick specimen as this particular one is. So this is the nuclear profile of a Sertoli cell. This is one, Sertoli cell, Sertoli cell, uh, Sertoli cell there, Sertoli cell, and Sertoli cell. The roundish cells beneath them, spermatogonia, 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 and a couple other spermatogonia, the ones in division as before primarily are the primary spermatocytes, so they too can be visualized as indicated by the pointer, though not as crisply and well preserved as the monkey preparation is, and is the reason for uh, actually using it. All, these are all primary spermatocytes. The little arrowhead or little dark projections in here are uh, the late spermatids. This is another cluster of the early uh, spermatids. So everything's virtually the same other than the fact that the cell types aren't nearly as well preserved, obviously. Uh, this is the paratubular uh, tissue with the myoid cells in the uh, human condition. If we get down to this uh, bottom field, we can see everything repeats itself again, even though the cell associations are a little bit different. So this would be just for additional examples, Sertoli cell, Sertoli cell, the nuclei of Sertoli cells, I should be saying. Sertoli cell, once again, the characteristic, the euchromatic nucleus and the nucleolus, those are the keys. One shown here, 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 there, there, and they can be made out. These would be spermatogonia, once again, along the base. Even a type A can be discerned here, once you know what the criteria, what to uh, look for because of the nuclear vacuole. Very close observation because it's staining so darkly. All of these cells, as indicated by the arrow dart, are in this meiotic division, but the chromosomes being uh, quite visible are pro of uh, uh, the primary spermatocyte. Other examples are, are seen here. And then, of course, the little dark arrowhead type things are the, our cells are the uh, late spermatids, and then there's some early spermatids here. So virtually all the cells can be visualized, but they're not nearly as well preserved as seen on this human testis. Even two Leydig cells have made their way into this particular uh, field of view. So these are human seminiferous tubules as seen at high magnification. This is a section through a prepubertal boy, once again showing the tunica albigenia as being crossed by the arrow, developing seminiferous tubules as shown to the extreme right, and then one can even make out the uh, visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis 
on the exterior surface of the tunica albigenia. But as one courses into the interior of this developing testis, several profiles of the seminiferous tubules can be discerned quite readily uh, together with the intervening uh, interstitial tissue, some of which contains uh, vasculature containing red cells. Uh, having once seen this particular view, uh, it should be examined at increased magnification and compared with the adult uh, testis. Seminiferous tubules of the prepubertal testis as seen at increased magnification. Please recall that the germinal epithelium in this particular type of a preparation, that is from a prepubertal uh, boy, consists primarily of Sertoli cells. And this is the nuclear profiles, the vast majority of which are shown here. And though it's not that well preserved, it will be sort of a tall columnar uh, form of epithelium. And scattered between the bases of the uh, Sertoli cells making up this type of uh, seminiferous epithelium, if we can get to a field here, one can make out sort of larger empty appearing cells. These would be the spermatogonia that lie within the bases sandwiched within this uh, Sertoli lining type of epithelium uh, and being lying and uh, ready to receive the uh, signals uh, for spermatogenesis uh, at the time of puberty. Here are perhaps a couple a little bit better profiles through the uh, seminiferous epithelium showing the Sertoli cells and a spermatogonia showing here. Another one profile of a seminiferous tubule here with the spermatogonia uh, at those two particular uh, locations. So the, semin or the germinal epithelium consists primarily of a Sertoli type of cell or the Sertoli cell that will look a little bit different once it's uh, stimulated by FSH. This particular point is just a, it looks like a tall columnar type of epithelium and it's nestled in between the bases along the basement membrane of the Sertoli cells one will find scattered uh, spermatogonia as indicated by the arrow. So this is are the seminiferous tubules from the testis of a prepubertal uh, boy. Unfortunately, I was unable to acquire a, some initial sections through the excurrent duct system, that is through the medial style area. So what is going to be missing are the tubuli erecti, or the straight tubules of the seminiferous tubules. That is those sh short interconnecting segments of the seminiferous tubules that lack spermatogenic cells. And then the reedy testis, which lies within the medial style area, as well as the efferent uh, ductules. So those three segments uh, will not be shown. The tubular recti, a section through the reedy testis, or the efferent ductules. So the next, or the first of the excurrent ductal system that we have a specimen of is that of the epididymis. Uh, this particular field represents a medium power uh, view of the ductus epididymis. Remember this particular duct is uh, seven or eight meters in length, so it's the very same duct or tubule cut in cross-section. It's just highly folded upon itself. So all of these profiles are through the 
the same duct, it's just got tightly coiled and you're getting several profiles through it. Typically appearing uh, epididymis, a series of cross-sectional profiles through tubules with intervening uh, connective tissue tightly holding them together. An initial observation, uh, one might think one was dealing with the seminiferous tubules within the testis. However, note that there are no spermatogenic cells present, which me makes that uh, initial observation uh, easily uh, dispelled. The epididymis, or the ductus epididymis, will consist of a uh, lining epithelium that consists of two cell types, a principal cell which will show the stereocilia from its apical surface. This is the most prominent and the tallest of the epithelial cell uh, types in the epithelial lining, and a basal cell population, little round cells located near the uh, base of the uh, epididymal epithelium. One can see a few slips of smooth muscle uh, starting to form around and start to form a bit of the uh, limiting wall of the epididymal duct. Having made some initial observations, scanning observations, then select a tubule and examine it very briefly at increased magnification for uh, the cytological details. A region of the epididymal epithelium seen at high magnification showing or demonstrating the principal cells, those tall columnar cells. Uh, their apices are united by tight junctions as illustrated here and these tufts or wisps coming off the apical surface are amalgamations of the stereocilia. A basal cell would be uh, as indicated by the tip of the pointer and perhaps if we move uh, the field uh, slightly as indicated uh, here uh, a number of these basal cells uh, can be demonstrated lying upon the basement membrane. These are simply replacement cells uh, for the principal cells. Nonetheless, they are present and satisfy the definition of a pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium uh, made up of the two si cell types, the principal cells and the basal cells. Close observation uh, in this particular field, one can make out the tight junctions or the, uh, as indicated by the tip of the pointer and one can sort of see the boundaries or the width of the apices of these uh, epithelial cell types. Once again, the stereocilia, in this vacuolated area in the supranuclear cytoplasm uh, is the light microscopic uh, depiction of huge, well-developed Golgi complexes that reside within this particular epithelial cell type. The smooth muscle wall is, uh, if we look at this tubule, is a little bit better demonstrated than this particular tubule you can see is only two or three uh, layers thick at this particular point, but it will gradually increase in thickness and depth uh, as one approaches the tail of the epididymis where it's going to join to the next excurrent ductule system or the excurrent duct system, that is the vas deferens. This is another section of the ductus epididymis, but in this particular case, it's from a man, a human uh, ductus uh, epididymis, and showing you it's roughly the same as in uh, other species, just to uh, demonstrate that particular uh, point. Once again, made up of the two cell types, uh, the principal cell, and even at this low magnification, one can make out the stereocilia coming from the apex, apices of the uh, principal cells, and basal cells also uh, will be present.
just a very quick uh, clip to illustrate the lining epithelium of the epididymis from a human subject showing the basal cells, the nuclei of which are being indicated uh, by the pointer, and the principal cells, which the nuclei, which are much more elongated in nature, uh, from these very tall cells also now being indicated by the pointer. If one looks at the apices, uh, these are the stereocilia in this human uh, preparation of the epididymis. The ductus epididymis then becomes continuous with the next major portion of the ductal system, the excurrent ductal system, that of the uh, vas deferens, or the ductus deferens, as shown here in the center of the field of view at low magnification, or with the scanning uh, objective. As you will recall, this is the most muscular tube in the body. When examining or looking at the ratio of the lumen to the size of the wall, the lumen, as we will see, it continues to be lined by a uh, pseudostratified columnar type of epithelium, as is the majority of the male reproductive system. An important feature of the excurrent ductal system, or this portion of the excurrent ductal system, is its muscle wall. The wall of the uh, ductus deferens consists of an inner longitudinal layer, as indicated by the pointer and crossed by the pointer, a middle circular layer, which is now being crossed by the pointer, and an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle now being uh, indicated and crossed by the pointer. So this is a very, very muscular tube uh, which can forcibly, forcibly expel uh, a spermatozoa in a very short uh, period of time. This is a portion of the wall of the vas deferens as seen at increased or high magnification, illustrating the lining epithelium, which is pseudostratified columnar in nature and consists of, uh, as did the uh, epididymal duct, a lining of principal cells as well as uh, basal cells, those replacement cells for the principal cells. So this particular duct, as is the majority of the male system, is lined by a pseudostratified uh, columnar type of epithelium. It is supported by a thin lamina propria made up of fibroblasts, a few connective tissue uh, fibers, collagen and elastin, and within it will be found typical connective tissue cells and the vasculature, uh, the capillaries. If we continue to course beyond the lamina propria into the muscularis, one can see that the muscle wall consists of inner longitudinal fibers, middle circular fibers, and then finally the third layer, the outer layer of longitudinal fibers. This will all be held in place by a surrounding adventitia. This particular field illustrates a section through the human uh, vas deferens, but one taken through its distal end uh, near the region of the ampulla, that is near its termination. You can see it's a little bit uh, larger structure, though it shows the same characteristics as uh, observed earlier in the uh, primate. One knows immediately that one is dealing with the uh, ampular region is because of this appearance of the elaborately folded nature of the uh, uh, mucosa along its, uh, that surrounds the lumen. So this elaborate infolding mimics that of the seminal vesicle. So even though the wall has not thinned out, we are now know we are approaching the distal end, which remains very similar throughout its length uh, when it's not near uh, the ampular region. It would be very similar to that as was demonstrated with the, uh, the primate. Nonetheless, it has this robust, extraordinarily thick 
muscular wall. And if we focus here just a little bit, one can see it has an, an inner longitudinal, a large middle circular, and outer longitudinal layers. The um, circular layer in the human uh, being is the uh, most dominant layer uh, of the muscle wall. And I think that can be illustrated here. One can see the broken uh, sort of inner longitudinal layer here, circular, and then outer longitudinal, and then the adventitia here. The primary difference is the uh, mucous membrane or the mucosa is thrown into these elaborate folds that mimic uh, the seminal vesicle. This is a section through a portion of the wall of the seminal vesicle, one of the accessory sex glands in the male. This also is uh, human tissue. Uh, like the vas deferens, the seminal vesicle consists of a mucosa or a mucous membrane uh, made up of a usually a pseudostratified columnar type of epithelium supported by a thin uh, lamina propria. It also has a well-developed muscle wall, a muscularis, <coughs> consisting of inner circular and outer longitudinal layers. And then there's a, a, a connective tissue uh, equivalent to an adventitia that <coughs> unites uh, it to, that is the seminal vesicle, to adjacent structures. It is characterized once again by the primary, secondary, and maybe even tertiary foldings of the mucous membrane as illustrated here. This is very, very characteristic of the seminal vesicle. Remember, this is a fairly large organ lying at the base of the prostate, and it has numerous chambers, a portion of one of which is shown here, that all unite, uh, that is the lumina of each, unite in a central uh, lumen. If we course now away from the wall of the seminal vesicle, and we're now entering that of the uh, distal vas deferens, so you can see the close approxi uh, proximity. So this is the lumen now, as seen with low power, of the ampulla of the vas deferens. And you can see it's thick. Uh, muscle wall consisting of an inner longitudinal, middle circular, and outer longitudinal layers. You know it's the ampulla of the vas and not a seminal vesicle uh, compartment simply because it's a circular round tubular structure. So this is a tube, the other one is more elongated and flat, and the muscle wall frankly isn't uh, uh, nearly as thick. So this is the human seminal vesicle as seen with the scanning objective. This particular field is through the center of the prostate near the prostatic urethra. So we have prostatic glands or the lumina of some of the glands uh, over in this particular area as seen with this scanning uh, objective. However, the primary element of focus on this particular section are these two oval shaped lumina uh, in the center of the field of view. These two elements are the ejaculatory ducts as they are coursing through the prostate to enter the urethra. A little diverticulum uh, from the urethra is shown here. So this is a little fold. Uh, it's lined by transitional epithelium. Uh, of these two ejaculatory ducts will continue on away from us, go out sort of into the field of view, and will eventually join the uh, uh, prostatic urethra. Note that the supporting wall of these two structures has lost its smooth muscle, and it's mainly being supported now at this particular point by a dense band of collagen or a dense wall of collagen uh, forms the supporting wall. Additional co collagenous material is shown in this particular area and is more eosinophilic or it has a more of a reddish hue than does uh, surrounding smooth muscle uh, and as indicated here in the fibromuscular stroma 
of surrounding uh, prostatic tissue. So these are two of the, or the two ejaculatory ducts uh, near the uh, human prostatic urethra. A portion of the wall of the ejaculatory duct as seen at high magnification, illustrating the pseudostratified columnar or stratified columnar nature uh, of the epithelium lining the uh, ejaculatory duct, its thin, delicate supporting lamina propria, and then the dense collagenous wall uh, giving support to the inner lining uh, mucous membrane. If we course now through to the other side, the other ejaculatory duct, these vents or, <coughs> excuse me, structures repeat themselves once again. In this particular illustration, perhaps, uh, the epithelium looks a bit more stratified uh, columnar in nature, uh, again, supported by thinner lamina propria, and then the absence of smooth muscle, uh, the wall of these particular structures as they course through the interior of the prostate to empty into the uh, prostatic urethra, uh, the uh, ductal system has lost its smooth muscle and now is supported by this uh, dense irregular uh, type of connective tissue, primarily collagen and fibroblast. Recall that the ejaculatory ducts are formed by the uniting of the distal end of the ampulla of the vas deferens and the duct of the seminal vesicle. Those two elements unite to form a single ejaculatory duct, of which there are two. Uh, this particular section is through the uh, prostatic urethra and the section also transects uh, the prostate, which is shown and outlined by the arrow. So the prostatic urethra is this lumen in the center of this block of tissue, and it of course is going to be lined by transitional epithelium because of its close proximity to the bladder. But this particular scanning views of the entire section shows is the uh, mucosal glands of the prostate, very closely associated and emptying into the lumen right about here. Here are some of these little glands. So these are the mucosal uh, glands of the prostate. Surrounding them uh, to their exterior, another group of smaller glands associated here, and then coursing around uh, as where the arrow indicates, then going out of the field of view. These are the submucosal glands, and these larger glandular structures in the surrounding area and going out of the section uh, in this location are the principal prostatic glands, and it is the principal prostatic glands that are going to make up the bulk of the prostate. And finally, all of these glands and the substance of the prostate are limited by a very vascular fibroelastic capsule uh, way to the exterior, which is not shown on this particular uh, preparation. The section that's in the loan collection is a section uh, very near the capsule and is through the principal prostatic uh, glands. Uh, this particular illustration is a low power scanning view uh, through the principal glands of the prostate. Uh, a single gland is shown coursing uh, through uh, the center of the field of view. Remember these are compound tubular alveolar types of glands and the prostate is a composite gland consisting of maybe 30 to 50 of such glands which have grown out from the prostatic urethra that is, they grow empty into the ure urethra, so they've grown out from this area into a surrounding fibromuscular stroma, which will, or what, uh, which will develop into a fibromuscular stroma. If one thinks of it in those terms. So this is the gland, a gland, one of the principal prostatic glands, 
and with very careful observation one can make out even with the scanning objective at the tip of the arrow the abundance of smooth muscle uh, that will contribute to this fibromuscular stroma that envelops and surrounds these glands and their secretory units. Uh, so if one courses through and just examines uh, several regions of the prostate, uh, remember these are profiles of different glands coming in uh, from uh, a variety of angles, making it somewhat confusing. But if one remembers the fibromuscular stroma, which is not seen anywhere else in the body that has developed to this extent, and uh, how those whirls course through the substance of the prostate and envelop uh, the prostatic glands. Also characteristic of the prostate are these structures. These are the prostatic concretions, collections of secretory material that accumulate uh, within the lumina of the prostatic glands and seem to increase with age. They may even uh, calcify. So this is the low power view coursing through a region of the prostate that consists or contains mainly the principal uh, prostatic glands. Uh, very, very characteristic. Once again, if we stop midway between some glandular units, note the abundance of smooth muscle, even when that can be visualized with this hematoxin, eosin stain, coursing through, wrapping around the glandular units and forming that intense uh, fibromuscular stroma, uh, characteristic of the uh, prostate. prostate, once again, principal glands, but seen at a slight increase in magnification. And perhaps one is to able to visualize a little bit more dramatically the fibromuscular stroma. In the center of the field of view is one of the alveoli of the principal prostatic glands, a prostatic concretion uh, located at the tip of the arrow. But now direct one's attention to the surrounding stroma and note the abundance of smooth muscle as it courses around and between the uh, glandular units of the prostatic glands. This is a, a, a very good view of this fibromuscular stroma. Very, very dramatic and very characteristic of the prostate. Uh, if one just slowly courses at an intermediate power and looks at the uh, prostatic gland uh, coming in the, this particular left-hand side of the field of view, but keep watching the background with which these glands are embedded in, these 30 to 50 glands, and one will see the fibromuscular stroma coming up uh, quite well whirling and coursing at a variety of angles. The epithelial lining of the prostatic glands has a more of a mucoid uh, sort of texture to it or uh, character to it, I should say. Uh, like it's producing uh, a mucin type of material, a clear light staining type of epithelium that shows considerable variation depending on the uh, amount of secretory material within it. Some regions showing a pseudostratified columnar, others columnar, or in some where it's extremely uh, filled with secretion, may even have a squamous uh, type of character. Here we're going through another uh, region, and uh, here's one of those uh, regions that is perhaps dilated a little bit, having a little more of secretory material within it at one time. Here coming into the field of view are two fairly large prostatic concretions, also characteristic of the uh, prostate. You see there are a number of them in this particular uh, field. 
So these elements, the compound tubular alveolar types of gland of that uh, character, these isolated units appearing within a very dense fibromuscular stroma with the abundance of smooth muscle uh, within the stroma uh, is characteristic and diagnostic for the human prostate. This is a section of normal human prostate uh, stain immunohistochemically for prostatic specific antigen or PSA. Uh, please do recall that PSA as well as uh, acid phosphatase are normally uh, produced by the epithelium of the prostatic glands. So this is simply a demonstration of human prostate uh, using this immunohistochemical marker to show its uh, presence within the epithelium of these principal prostatic glands. And this happens to be a gland uh, we're looking at in the center of the field of view. This edge is perhaps more informative because in addition to the uh, compound tubular alveolar gland of this principal prostatic gland, one again gets to view the uh, smooth muscle in this rather uh, dense fibromuscular stroma and the smooth muscle that courses around the glandular units. This is simply just a demonstration of the uh, prostatic specific antigen as it occurs normally in the uh, prostatic epithelium. Uh, this particular section is a cross section fairly high up the shaft of uh, an entire human penis. So this is a cross sectional profile uh, of this particular uh, male reproductive organ. What can be visualized uh, looking at grossly this entire slide is the corpus cavernosum urethrae or the corpus spongiosum uh, if you uh, uh, prefer to call it uh, using that term uh, as indicated by the arrow the penile urethra or the lumen thereof lies at the tip of the arrow. Now the other two erectile uh, cylinders also are shown in this particular section the uh, capra, uh, corpus cavernosum penis or just the corpus cavernosa are shown here. The other erectile body is shown here. Note that they are both enveloped by a considerable tunica albuginea which is shown here. This is all cavernosus tissue uh, occupying the center uh, or erectile tissue if you prefer to uh, use that particular term. The other corpus is located here again surrounded by a fairly robust thick tunica albuginea, the cavernosus tissue, uh, this darker tissue uh, located at the arrow. So both of the uh, corpa, the corpus cavernosum, are bounded by this very thick tunica albuginea and near the center, this is where that pectiniform septum is, a septum that usually will have vascular channels going across that allow some communication between these two erectile bodies. The corpus spongiosum or the corpus cavernosum urethrae also is bounded by a tunica albuginea uh, but it is much thinner in comparison to those of the other two erectile bodies. This is fairly high up uh, the shaft because the issue cavernosus muscle here, some skeletal muscle is coming into the field. Uh, some other structure that are also uh, shown on this particular uh, structure is a, a vessel here. Uh, this should be the dorsal, a uh, deep uh, dorsal vein of the penis and just lateral up to that should be the uh, dorsal arteries one there and one uh, at that particular location. 
So this is a transverse or a cross-sectional uh, profile of the human penis, seen uh, just grossly looking at the entire slide. The only specimen contained uh, within the loan collection is the corpus spongiosum urethrae, uh, which is this structure uh, right here as an example of some erectile tissue as well as the uh, penile urethra contained within it. Uh, one can also visualize quite well the limiting tunica albiginia. This is a field of the uh, dorsal aspect of the penis as seen through the scanning objective. This structure here uh, is the uh, deep dorsal vein and if we go laterally in either direction, one can see the uh, dorsal arteries of the penis, uh, one of which is shown here, uh, the lumen being located here. Uh, these structures usually you see from a gross anatomical perspective, but it would be of interest just to see these structures uh, through the light microscope. And the uh, deep dorsal nerve is in this particular area, you can see the tremendous uh, number of nerve bundles and fascicles uh, uh, in this particular organ as one would uh, anticipate. So th this is the one of the uh, deep dorsal nerves, deep dorsal artery, a central vein, and then if we go on the other side, this system repeats itself. There's the uh, uh, dorsal artery located here, and then once again, it's uh, nerve bundles uh, located on uh, scattered around, but yet clustered together in the so-called uh, dorsal nerve of the penis. Now, if we go down towards its ventral surface, this huge mass of collagen here is the tunica albiginia. It starts here and goes to about this level, and then we get into the uh, cavernosus tissue of one of the uh, corpus cavernosum urethrae, or corpus cavernosa, excuse me. Uh, so this uh, is all cavernosus tissue or erectile tissue, and this large vessel, large artery uh, in the center of this erectile tissue is the uh, deep artery. Likewise, if we cut across, this is all tunica albiginia once again. Uh, this would be the region of the pectiniform septum between the uh, two uh, corpus cavernosum. Tunica albiginia once again, and then once again into the uh, erectile tissue or cavernosus tissue of the uh, corpus cavernosum. And here again would be that uh, deep artery to these particular structures. And now tunica albiginia as we are now leaving uh, the two paired corpora on the dorsal surface and hopefully making our way down finally to this structure here. So this is the urethra, uh, the penile urethra, and you can see there's an abundance of erectile tissue or cavernosus tissue associated with it. It's perhaps not as well developed. And then it also has a tunic albiginia, but note that it is not nearly of the depth of that surrounding the corpus cavernosa. Uh, those two dorsal uh, erectile cylinders. You can see this erectile tissue or the cavernosus spaces are suffused with blood yet, and so it re repeats itself over and over again uh, and limited by a much thinner tunic albiginia. So this is the penile urethra. It's mucous membrane surrounded by a lamina propria that goes down the center of the corpus spongiosum, 
or the cavernosum urethrae, however you want to uh, describe it. This is the epithelium lining the uh, penile urethra, uh, which is fairly high. What of, is of interest here, these are these mucus secreting glands, these intraepithelial glands, the so-called glands of Latre, uh, commonly found in the uh, penile urethra. If one looks at the uh, organization, the layering of the epithelial lining of the urethra at this point, uh, several areas are shown that show a stratified columnar type uh, of epithelium, and this is fairly common in this particular area. So this is all stratified columnar, stratified type of epithelium with the surface cells being of a columnar nature. So this is fairly common uh, in the proximal portion of the penile urethra. But even so, because it's this high, there are certain areas, as, you get, uh, as we look around, that have a more transitional appearance to them uh, rather than a stratified squamous type, again suggestive of uh, it's fairly high uh, along the shaft of the penis where this particular section was taken. This is a little fold that came out from the lumen and once again illustrates fairly well these small mucus secreting groups of cells, the uh, glands of Latre uh, that characterize also the uh, penile urethra. Another little cluster, wherever you have these outfoldings, they seem to like to reside in those uh, sort of hidden areas. Those are the uh, glands of Latre, these little mucus secreting uh, clusters of uh, cells. Sometimes they do extend a little bit away from the lumen, uh, or so it appears, but they are in that luminal lining epithelium. Here's another little cluster of these mucus secreting cells. So this is just an example, a fairly well-preserved example of the uh, human penile urethra and its lining epithelium, including uh, the glands of Latre, which are shown at the arrow. Just a short clip of uh, human seminal uh, plasm illustrating uh, four spermatozoan or sperm cells. And what these cells show is just the head that's going to contain the nuclear area and of course the <coughs> tails, the details of which really can't be made out in any great uh, form of detail. The uh, sperm in the middle of the field of view does show a little bit, even though it's a little bit disrupted. Right about at this portion is the uh, length or the uh, width of the acrosome as it forms a little cap over the uh, nuclear area. So I believe this little uh, ring right here indicates the end of the acrosome. The remainder of the acrosome f fits over the head of the spermatozoan and uh, gives it that short of, uh, a shorter, uh, brighter sheen to it. Uh, likewise, one can see the uh, post-acrosomal region right about here at, at this particular uh, location. So these are simply four sperm or spermatozoa uh, from a human uh, sample from the IV clinic, as seen with the scanning electron microscope. Uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of a human spermatozoan or sperm cell. The nucleus is shown here. Uh, the darker area of this head area that contains that nucleus is covered with this darker material which sort of reflects the acrosome which goes to about where the tip of the arrow is. The middle piece of this particular spermatozoan extends from uh, this region to here. This is, remember, where the mitochondrial wrap is. And the remainder of the tail that is visible on this particular illustration is the principal piece of the tail. So this is a single uh, human spermatozoan as seen with the scanning electron microscope.